Praise God. We are talking about a very important topic as a part of our series about the order of the end time events. When I say interesting, it is really interesting. And I could tell you all the reasons why they are interesting, both from naysayers and those who are really affirming this phenomenon we call the rapture. Okay, so last Sunday we already started about this topic. So let me just share to you the first, uh, we, got, we, we got to tackle one point last Sunday, and this is what it says regarding the rapture. I just numbered it, did not categorize them in groups, so we're just going to, again, go through the principles of the rapture as we read the verses that pertain to it, and learn beautiful and important values and truths that we learn from those scriptures. We're going to focus on that, that's what we learn, because a lot of people have different uh, interpretations regarding the rapture. So how do we get to know the truth? Scriptures. Go back to the Bible. Go back to the basics and our foundations. So the first one we talked about last Sunday was one of its purposes. When you, when you say its purposes, that's a rapture's purpose. Okay, One of the rapture's purposes is for us to grieve in the context of hope. I'm not going to elaborate on that any further, but let me just share to you the sub-points under that. The first thing we talked about was that it's necessary that we know about the rapture. And then letter B is, it's something that happens to believers who die. It's something that happens to believers who die. And then letter C is, believers still grieve, albeit with hope. Okay, we still grieve. It's not wrong to grieve. So... The key verses that we are going to read at this point is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And this is, one, it's, uh, this is what it says. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns... God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Let me read, let me read to you the very last verse again. So encourage each other with these words. So when we talk about the rapture of the church, we start off from that foundational position. What is that? This is for encouragement. The rapture is not for us to have contentions and getting angry and getting like confused about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is primarily for us to be encouraged as believers. Because being a believer, guys, friends, families, we know it's a hard life. Being a believer is not an easy life. It's, it's easy for some of us, perhaps. But a lot of times it is not. That's the reason why we have already heard it many times. The expression we've come up with uh, here at church. What is that? So I, I'm, I know other people share that as well. And what is that? Christianity is not hard. It is impossible. Christianity is not hard. It is impossible. That's the reason why Christianity is based on the work of God in our lives. Amen? Because that's what makes it possible. With men... Things may be impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. All right? So we're going to look at the second part now, but it is for encouraging each other. We are having it hard, but God is saying, encourage each other with this. So when you talk about the rapture of the church, that's our mindset. So the second thing I'd like to point out is found in verse 14 of that same sad uh, segment of scriptures we've just read. And this is the truth. That I'd like to share to you. The second truth. It is a belief. Rapture is a belief that believers who have died will be with Jesus. Okay, I want you to take note of that word, will be with Jesus. Because there's a little bit confusing part here for some people. It is a belief that believers who have died will be 
with Jesus. The first Thessalonians 4.14, again, I want you to watch. I want you to understand what it says. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. I'll read that to you again later on. But from that verse, you see that the bases or pillars, or I would say the bases, the pillars or the foundations for this belief that we have and confidence are not made up. They are factual. You talk about the raptures, we've got foundations that are factual that make us come up with the belief on the rapture. What are those beliefs that are foundational regarding the rapture? Before he talks about, before he talks about God bringing us with him or bringing believers with him, those who have died, there are three things he pointed out. Okay, The first one is our belief that our Lord Jesus died. Second one is our belief that our Lord Jesus rose back to life. All of these are part of the rapture foundation. Okay, Jesus died, Jesus rose back to life, and our belief that Jesus will return. I believe that Jesus will return. So how important are those? If you look at the belief that our Lord Jesus died, the reason why I want to point that out is because there's a lot of people and a lot of groups, even religious persuasions, who try to deny the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want to believe that Jesus really died. And the reason, one of the prime reasons that they want to tell people that, that Jesus did not really die, is because that's their polemic, or that's their argument, or that's their defense against the second foundational belief that we have. What is that? That Jesus rose from the dead. Are you understanding this? Like, if Jesus really didn't die, he didn't really rise from the dead. Right? So, but for Christians like you and me, listen how, to how important this belief or foundational belief in the resurrection of the, of the dead is. Okay? Because... Everything in Christianity rises and falls in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means to say everything that we believe in about the rapture rises and falls with our belief on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says these words. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? That's talking about resurrection. What Paul was saying is, if resurrection was not true, we believers, we Christians, are the most pathetic people in the world. Because we're believing something that we count so valuable and so precious, but we are deceived into believing that when it wasn't really true. Okay, so... If, we, if, if resurrection is not really true, that means to say that the ultimate destiny of you and me, of human beings, of you and me, our ultimate or final destiny is what? Ashes, dust, or food to the worms. Right? You're there to make the worms fat. That's our final destiny. But no, that's not our final destiny, Right? We believe that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a established or an established foundational truth. We know it's true. We're not making it up. So we're not the most pathetic people in the world. We're not the most pitiable people in the world. We are the most blessed people in the world. Amen. 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 Okay, so those are the foundations we'll see here. Okay, And then the next one is our belief. One of the foundations is that our belief... He died, he rose again, and the next foundation is that he will return. He will return. He will come back. Listen, I told you beforehand, before we started the series, that in, among religious people, among Christians even, there are many differences when it comes to the belief or interpretation as to the manner of Jesus returning or the timing of Jesus' returning. There are differences in those beliefs, a gazillion differences. But one thing that we commonly share and all of us agree on, what is that? That He is going to come back. Yeah. We may have all differences in belief regarding the details of that, but we all believe Jesus is going to return. So having all of those said foundations, now we go back. And by the way, as a part of that verse where he says God will bring back with him. I want to I talk about this because it's very important. 
there are at least two possible interpretations here. When he says, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. When Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Okay, listen. This is talking about the rapture, not the second coming. We understand that for the second coming. We are all going to come back with Jesus after the rapture, right? But this is talking about him returning in the rapture, at least the context of so why is it saying that God will bring back with him believers who have died? When we know the rapture supposedly is talking about Jesus taking up to him the believers who are dead and the believers who are alive. So there are two possible interpretations I come up with regarding this. The first one is that it may be referring to the spirits and souls of the departed saints, departed believers. What is that? When Jesus comes back for the rapture, he's, he's not going to come back by himself alone. So the possibility is that when Jesus comes back for the rapture, the dead saints, believers who have already died, remember that, when the believers die, our belief is that they don't stay in the ground, unconscious, and their spirit stagnant in the ground. You call that doctrine soul sleep. Everybody say soul sleep. Okay, so some of that's something we don't espouse. We don't believe that. We believe that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent is the body, and then the spirit is present with the Lord. So when the rapture comes, what we believe is he's going to bring with him the spirits and the souls of those who passed away already. Okay? So that's the first interpretation. Second interpretation is something that goes beyond the rapture itself. So the rapture happens. So this is more of a conjoining. It's like the spirit and the souls, the immaterial part of us who now lives in the presence of the Lord. When he comes back, the dead in Christ, the bodies of the dead in Christ will be raised. And then the immaterial part and the material part will join together. And then they go back. To heaven in the presence of God. Thus, He will bring them. Okay? He will bring them. He will bring back believers with Him who have died. So those are the two possible things, interpretations that definitely are not um, bad to look at. It's not going to be, if, if it's something wrong, one of them is right, one of them is wrong. It's not heretical. If both of them are right, possibly. I believe both of them are right. Um, I believe so with all my heart that both of them are right, then you got a good interpretation of this verse. Okay? So the next one. Number three. Okay, the third truth that I see here. Are you enjoying this? Are you learning something? Okay, this is again, this is one of the most interesting topics in the Word of God. And a lot of times, as I said, when you talk about the rapture, all you t think about is like that boom, twinkling of an eye change. That's it. Okay, there's a lot about the rapture that are really beautiful and interesting. Okay, and a lot of like uh, details and nuances about it that we as believers in the Lord have to learn. So you know, now we've got the third major truths. The rapture, it happens at a specific order. Okay? It happens at a specific order. Where do you see that? I'm going to read to you 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, 7, 15 through 17. This is the order of the rapture. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. There's a lot that's, that's pregnant with interpretations, but we're not going to elaborate on that. But it says, first the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with Him, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Okay, so this is the order of events. Specifically, this is what the Lord himself said through Paul will transpire. The first one, our Lord Jesus comes down from heaven. You see that in the verse. Our Lord Jesus comes down from heaven. Now in our interpretation, with the souls and spirits of departed loved ones. Okay? So he comes down from heaven. And the second order of the sequence is the believers who have died, they rise from their graves. And then the third order is believers who are still alive. If you and I are still alive during that time, 
then we will also be raised, get caught up in the clouds with those dead saints. Okay? Now, when you think about those things, it seems that so many things are going on, right? It seems like so many things are going on, but we know we're going to talk about it later on. You would see how quickly these things actually happen. Okay? And God does not have any problem doing that, making that happen. Okay, so now, having said that order, Jesus comes down. The dead in Christ rises first. Those who are alive gets caught up together with them in the clouds. I believe there is a beautiful moment for us to address one of the most common arguments against the rapture of the church. What is that? Because we touched it on the verse, we probably just did not recognize that. What is that greatest, like one of the greatest accusations against the teachings of the rapture? Anybody knows? Here it is. That's not found in the Bible. The rapture is not found in the Bible. What are you talking about, Pastor? You've been teaching me from the Bible. It seems like it's there. It seems like it's there. But the word itself, they say, is not found in the Bible. And sometimes uh, I would say, uh, with um, not accusatively, but I would say with grace and mercy. But nowadays when you, when you say that or somebody says that as an excuse, it's a very elementary, fundamental, and almost like a very childish thing to say. Because we know that in our stand as Christians, especially if, you're, if a person saying that or making that argument is a believer, because there are, I've already proven and I've already mentioned this in the pulpit, that there are so many truths in Christendom that we use, words that we use, that are not found in the Bible. How many of you believe, how many of you believe in the Trinity? Yeah, you do? Three persons in one God? The word Trinity is not in the Bible. How many of you believe? As I said, there's no problem about... There may be problems regarding the rapture, but there is no problem in agreeing, in agreeing about the second coming. Okay? How many of you believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? The words second coming is not in the Bible. And we know after the second coming, there's a 1,000 year reign. We, we call it the millennial kingdom or the millennial, millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that? Because it's so specific in the Bible. Like, how many of you believe in the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That word millennial reign in millennial kingdom is not in the Bible. How many of you believe? It's the most wonderful time of the year. What is that? Christmas, okay, it talks about incarnation, right? You've heard the word incarnation. What is incarnation? God becoming flesh. Carne, incarnation. That's it. Meat. God becoming flesh. That's incarnation. How many of you believe that? That Jesus really came down as a babe, as a human being. He became flesh. That word incarnation is not in the Bible. How many of you believe the Bible? The Bible word is not in the Bible. That's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying, I'm making a point here that just because the word rapture is not found specifically in the Bible does not mean it is heretical. That it's not found or the truth or the concept is not found in the Bible. So this is where you see it. Okay, I want you to look at it. Because if it's not in the Bible, how did we come up with it? I know many of you have heard this before. But it's worth repeating because this is how we explain this to other people. By explaining this, you would know that it's very possible that the rapture could actually be a biblical term. Okay? How are you going to say that? Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, this is what it says. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. Everybody say caught up. Okay, I'll stop there. We'll be caught up together in the clouds. I want you to concentrate on that word or phrase caught up. But that's the way it's translated in English. In the Greek, uh, as I said, we're not, I, don't, I don't need you to memorize these things, but I barely tell you Greek words here. I'm, not, I'm, I'm unlike a lot of very scholarly preachers and teachers who always go back to, read, to, to Greek and Hebrew. And the reason I don't find it necessary, because you probably will not memorize them anyway. Okay? Probably will not. But only at this point it's necessary for me to say it, because I will make a comparison. Okay? The Greek word for it is... Hapa gisometha. Okay? Hapa gisometha. Does it sound like rapture to you? The word caught up in the Greek is hapa gisometha. 
Or, because hapagi somita could be translated as, we shall be caught up. Or, taken away. Now, another Greek word is harpazo. Harpazo, or H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. Again, does it, is, it, is it close to the rapture word? No, it's not. It's not, right? We're trying to make it happen, but it's not. Harpazo, still far from rapture. Again, the meaning of that in the Greek is to be caught up. That's the reason why it is translated as caught up in your words. To be caught up, or here's a, for me, a more accurate translation is snatched away. It's a violent word. It's snatched away. That's, that's, I think, a better translation for the word rapture. Snatch away, or to raise from the, ga- from the ground, or to take for oneself. Okay, so we see from the original Greek word, it's not there. And now, sometimes, sometime at the end of 300 AD, and the beginning of 400 AD, there's somebody named Jerome who overtook, who took responsibility of translating the Greek or the Bible into the Latin. They call it the Latin Vulgate. Okay? From Greek, the Bible, from Hebrew and Greek, he translated the Bible to Latin, and it's called the Latin Vulgate. Now, in Latin, that word harpazo, or the other words I mentioned to you that I haven't even memorized, okay? He's translated that, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to read to you Greek words that talks about catching away or snatching away. Now listen, these are not Greek words, Latin words that talk about catching away or snatching away or taking away. Okay, these are the words. Raptus. Okay, it means carrying off. Okay, raptus or rapturo. Is this close to the word rapture? Okay. Raptus or rapturo or another other Greek words, rapiemur, rapio. All of those have something to do with catching up. Uh, catching, <laughs> catching up. <laughs> catching up. Rapture, catching up, right? That's better than closing your ears, right? You're closing your hearts from last week. Okay, so now, so you notice now, that the word, the English word rapture is very close to the Latin word rapturo or rapio. That's where we got the term or the doctrine rapture. We didn't base it on harpazo, although we could have started teaching other, like in the Bible school or in the church, we could have just started talking about, okay, everybody, we're going to talk about harpazo today. We believe in the harpazo. So every time I would say I believe in the harpazo, it's actually me saying I believe in the rapture. Except that now the derivative comes from the Latin word, rapturo. Now you understand that, right? So that means to say, and what is the meaning again of the word rapturo or harpazo? Cut up or snatch away. You basically saw that word rapture or harpazo from the English translation caught up. So now if I read again... This is the Adrian's translation of the Bible, which I know you will agree with me about. We could read that part where it says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We could translate it as, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be raptured. Right? We'll be raptured in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's not going above and beyond proper exegesis and interpretation of the word and translation. You got it? Okay, so that answers your question for you. Because some people really get mad. You guys are heretical. You do not have that word in the Bible. Why do you teach it? It's because it is in the Bible. Okay, just tell them it's in the Bible. And then they're going to probably come to you and go, prove it. Hey, praise God. Right? You're going to be able to prove it because all those things I've explained to you. Okay, now, the last one I got, no, not the last one, okay. One of the points under that is in, in, in this part here, all together, after we get caught up in the clouds, all together, all together, dead, alive, all together, we will meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture for you. Okay, that's the order of event. Okay, so now let me just close with this part here because I want to finish this part at least before we go to the part 3C, okay, regarding the rapture. Okay, the fourth truth, 
The fourth truth is this. We ought, I said this already before, I'll say it again, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. So encourage each other with these words. Okay? We ought to encourage each other with it. Okay, what are that? Okay, that there is such a phenomenon as the rapture of the church. It's a reality. It's true. Encourage each other with this. And then the next one, that after we get raptured, that we will be spending time with the Lord forever and forever. The moment rapture happens, from then on, it says there, okay, that we are going to be spending our eternity from that moment on with the Lord Jesus. We are not going to be separated ever again. Wherever Jesus will be, even if He comes back for the second coming, we will be with Him. If he, even if He comes back to war against the Antichrist and the devil and the angels, the fallen angels, we will be with Him. So we are going to be with the Lord forever. Isn't that an encouraging thing? How many of you love the Lord? I mean, honestly speaking, aside from the thought that we have loved ones and friends who are not saved, how many of you would want to spend time with the Lord now? There are so many things in life. Listen, even if you're a believer, we're so blessed. Our status in Jesus, we are so full of blessings. Blessings upon blessings pile up on us. Honestly, even with the most difficult problems and situations we face, we are just inundated by the blessings of God. We may be experiencing the same trials and difficulties that the world has, but the same time as those trials and difficulties are coming, Somehow we are experiencing the peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the freedom of God, the wonders of being a believer. I mean, you may be persecuted, they may be hurting you so much, and you are still rejoicing in God. But it is tough, right? It is tough. Here in our, in, in our country, we're not really experiencing a lot of hardships that 75% of the world's Christians are experiencing. They are having it really hard. But some of us, even if we're not experiencing hardships because we're Christians, we are experiencing a lot of hardships in life. Like me, as I'm growing older, I'm experiencing a lot of pain in my body. And sometimes when, re I, when I'm under an excruciating pain, you almost want to think like, is it really worth staying I'm staying for my family. I'm staying for my wife. You know, sometimes you want to you want to default to the thought like, I think we've already spent time enough with each other. <laughs> I've already fed my kids enough, trained them enough that they could all get married, and they'll be taken care of. I mean, the guys could now take over the bills. You know what I'm saying? Like, and my wife like. I've spent time with her. I still want to spend more time with her. But do you know that you think about it, what we're basically doing in this world is surviving, trying to survive, trying to earn, to survive and to live day by day. That's all we're, that's all we're doing. And in the meantime, we're trying to win people for Jesus because if we're not doing that, we're missing it out. Because that's really the most important thing anybody could ever have because this life here is going to end. But the beautiful thing about it again is the rapture will end everything in a transition. All of those problems, all of the health problems, every, even your debts, even your debts. If you just bought a brand new car, even your debts will be taken care of. Let me just say it's not going to be paid. But you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? So every weakness we have, every pain in our body, every tiring situation, it's like your fatigue, your stresses, your distresses, your oppressions, your bondages, all of those things in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, everything just dissipates and everything just becomes like a shade when you see the glory of Jesus face to face. Nothing will compare to that experience. So right now you may be watching again. How do you make sure of that? Very simply. Make sure the words we read a while ago was dead in Christ. Or asleep in Christ. Is that what we read a while ago there?
the rapture is promised. Did you notice that? Whether you're alive or you're dead, the rapture is promised to those who are in Christ. So if you're not yet sure about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very simple. It's a very humble step. And a lot of times the only reason why people still don't have Jesus in their lives is because not of a humble position, but because of pride. I'm okay. I don't need Him. I can do it by myself. I'm not hurting people. I'm not taking advantage of people. Not recognizing that we all are sinners and because of our sins, we're all separated from God. But if you're humble enough today to accept that and say, I want to receive Christ in my life and place my full dependence on Him for salvation, I cannot save myself. I will always sin. Probably as I become a believer, it's going to be less and less. But as for me, I cannot qualify for the perfect place with a perfect God in a perfect situation. I will always fall and I need Jesus. And if you want that today, we're inviting you. You can do it. If it's in your heart anyway, you can do it. Today is the day of your salvation. So everybody just close your eyes. Bow your heads. Pray this prayer together with those doing this for the first time. And if you are not yet sure about your relationship with Jesus, how real, how authentic, how genuine it is, today is the day you can receive that beautiful gift of eternal life. So just follow me in this prayer from the bottom of your heart sincerely. Say this. Dear God in heaven, I'm so grateful to you for showing me a beautiful hope, a beautiful promise, and a beautiful event and experience that's awaiting us. Lord, I want to be a part of that. I want to be caught up together with you in the clouds to be with you forever. And I want to make sure of that today. Lord, I know I have sinned against you and against many people. And I also understand that sin separates me from you. So I open my heart now and I invite you, please come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Come live in me. Forgive me of my sins. From now on, I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Praise God. As always, I encourage everybody, go ahead. Give the Lord a big round of praise. As a faith statement, that there will be a lot of people who will be receiving Jesus Christ from this message this morning. So, and if you did, whether you're receiving Him today live, or you're receiving Him a year after, a week after, a month after, probably a decade after, we still exist and Jesus hasn't come yet, contact us. Because you'll be, we want, it's our desire to really help you grow, us to grow together in the Lord in this journey, okay? God bless you. Give us that opportunity and joy of making that happen. God bless you.